Hi everyone, welcome to the fourth panel of Carnegie Middle East Center uh, 2024 Global Outlook. Uh, my name is Hamza Meddeb, I'm a research fellow at Carnegie Middle East Center and I'm absolutely delighted to uh, be moderating this panel on populism. Uh, I'll be joined by outstanding group of uh, scholars uh, whom I will be introducing in a minute. Actually, populism is extremely relevant to understand our work today, to understand the moment that we are uh, we are finding ourselves in. Uh, 2024 will be a big electoral year uh, with 40% of the global population uh, going to the polls uh, in different parts of the world. Um, in some countries, the outcomes of the elections are predictable. In other countries, uh, there, are, there is uncertainty or uncertainty prevails. But in most of the countries, actually, uh, populism is in, the, is in the rise. And this is really quite interesting. This is a global phenomena that needs to be uh, understood in, uh, in different, in its variations in Europe, in the US, and in the MENA region, of course, and in Latin America. So our, our conversation today uh, will try to explain or to understand why populism, why is populism so popular? We will be trying to understand and to explain the different trends in different parts of the world, and we'll be examining the different uh, variation, the, um, the different reasons behind the rise of, of, of populism uh, and the decline of democracy, of course. To do so, I'm really happy and glad to be joined by a group of, scholar, of scholars uh, um, um, who are experts of, uh, of democratization in different parts of the world. I'll start, uh, I will name them and the order I will turn to them. Um, so we have first Richard Youngs. Uh, Richard is a senior fellow in the Democracy, Conflict and Governance program based at uh, Carnegie Europe. He works on the EU foreign policy and on issues of international democracy. Welcome, Richard. Uh, we, uh, we have uh, also, Sarah Yerkes, my colleague and expert on Tunisia, Sarah. Sarah is senior fellow at Carnegie Middle East program, uh, where her research focuses on Tunisia's political, economic, and security developments, as well as state society relations in the Middle East and North Africa. Um, thank you for joining us, Sarah. Uh, next. Oliver Stenkel. Uh, Oliver is an associate professor at the School of International Relations at the Fundação Getúlio Vargas in Sao Paulo, Brazil. He is a non-resident scholar affiliated with the Democracy, Conflict and Governance Program at Carnegie Endowment for International Peace. Delighted to have you, Oliver. And we are planning to have uh, Rachel Kleinfeld. I hope Rachel we will be uh, will join us. I mean, in a few minutes. Uh, Rachel is a senior fellow uh, in Carnegie's um, Dem Democracy, Conflict and Governance program, where she is researching security, governance, polarization and violence and other governance pro problems. Um, so I will just, before starting our conversation, I will just want to remind the audience that we'd be happy to receive their questions through the chat. And I'll be uh, glad to share the questions with the uh, with the, with, the, with our panelists, of course, at the end of the uh, of the session. So uh, let me start with an overview of populism in the world with Europe, uh, in a way. Ah, hi, Re hi, Rachel. Nice Hello. to see you. Good to see you. Perfect. Uh, just a reminder. I mean, Rachel is our colleague, senior fellow at Carnegie Endowment for International Peace. Uh, uh, as I mentioned, and she's, uh, I mean, researching polarization, populism, and violence in the U.S. Uh, so uh, let me let me start uh, this uh, overview of populism in the in the world with Europe, with you, Richard, with uh, probably a first question because I mean we have been seeing, uh, I mean, in Europe. People uh, hitting to the streets, citizens in France and Germany and other European nations have been protesting recently. In June, they will be, uh, they will be, and they will vote for European elections with most likely and probably a surge of right-wing extreme populism, actually. Um, 
so how are the three P's? I would call them the three P's. I mean, protest, populism, and polarization. How are these trends reshaping the European political landscape? And to what extent will these trends determine the future of the EU, according to you? Uh, thank you, Hamza, and thank you very much for the invitation. It's a pleasure to be here. Uh, you, you are right that the trends in Europe at the moment are rather worrying. Um, Far-right populist parties are on the rise and look set to do very well in the European elections in June. Uh, their support has fluctuated quite a bit over recent years. Interestingly, during the COVID pandemic, it looked as if they were on the back foot and some experts were wondering if we'd, pe if we'd passed peak populism, as it were, whereas now they've their popularity is surging and they've really returned to the forefront of politics with some uh, vengeance. There is a debate, this may sound a bit pedantic, over whether what's popular in Europe is populism or whether it's the far right. Those two things clearly overlap with each other a lot, but they're not quite the same uh, thing. The far right parties that are doing well at the moment contain much that is populist, but uh, arguably they represent a more serious but a narrower challenge than populism understood as a wider concept. So I think that's important as a, as a kind of framing issue for our debate here. Uh, clearly, the far right is set to do well, both in the European elections and in several crucial national European elections this year. Just a couple of caveats, though. In most countries and in the European elections, uh, far right parties will not win. In the European elections, they're still well behind the two mainstream centre-left, centre-right um, groupings. Uh, they may finish third. That's uh, the current uh, what current polling is showing. And that it, in, in itself would be a shock to the system. And as you speculate, would have quite far-reaching uh, impacts on European uh, politics. There are many reasons behind the rise of the far right. There's different uh, driving factors behind the rise of different far-right parties. Some are driven by the migration issues, other, uh, others more by economic or political uh, considerations, others more by a backlash against climate action. So th that's also another nuance to add to our debate. The far-right is not the same in all European countries. Uh, it's, it's all illiberal and all represents quite a serious challenge, but there are harder and softer versions of the hard right. Some far right parties are very authoritarian and clearly represent an extremely serious systemic challenge to European politics. In other countries, far right parties are very illiberal and one may disagree very strongly with their individual policy positions, but it's a bit more debatable that they really represent um, a challenge to um, or the, the whole institutional structure of European democracy. So there are variations in that sense. It's also worth saying that most far-right parties don't want to bring down the EU. They're, they're, they're Eurosceptic, but most of them have a vision. They don't want to take their countries out of the EU or see the complete collapse of the European project. Most of them want to see a different kind of uh, European Union based more around the, the nation state, a more power, more prominent role for national government. So it's a more nationalist uh, version of European uh, cooperation. So th that kind of thinking will begin to have an impact on, on what happens at the European level and begin to reshape European politics in, in that direction. I think my, the main point I would leave on the table for our discussion is this, that I think the challenge is not just um, how well individual far-right parties do in elections, what percentage they score in elections, but the way that their ideas are beginning to seep into the agendas of other parties and how they are beginning to, to set or co-create the agenda in Europe across many different uh, uh, issue areas. And I think it's there that they could, these parties could have 
their most far-reaching impact on European politics. So even if they don't win power, even if their popularity may, may peak at a relatively modest level, that there's no doubt that they're beginning to set the agenda. And I think the more complicated debate is how they set that agenda. And I think arguably many of their policy positions represent really serious existential threats to core liberal values in Europe, whereas other parts of their positions perhaps represent a more justifiable fear on the part of large parts of the population about economic uh, injustices, um, the perception that the climate agenda is not being managed in a particularly open or, or fair way. And I think that those kinds of concerns perhaps open some opportunity for mainstream parties to begin to address the grievances at a popular level that are actually driving the, the surge in far-right party support. Thank you, Richard. I mean, these are really extremely important po po points, I mean, to frame our discussion, the distinguish distinction between or the, the difference between populism and far-right far parties, um, I mean, it's really worth to be, uh, to be made. But also your point on the fact to uh, the capacity of these parties to challenge uh, institutions or not, their willingness to, inst to challenge institutions or not, and more specifically, their capacity to set the agenda, to co-create the agenda. I mean, in France and in many other countries, there is really talks, there are talks about the victory of the far, far rights, the ideological victory of far rights in a way, in a sense that they have the capacity now to frame and to set the agenda and to push my mainstream parties to, uh, to the right. So these are really extremely important point, points, actually. Uh, before moving to the Global South, to the MENA and Latin America, I'd like to maybe to uh, uh, bring Rachel to the discussion and to discuss the U.S. because here we have another, another other aspects or other another variation, let's say, of populism, um, um, with especially with the election of uh, of uh, that started or maybe before the election of Trump in 2017. Um, but what was really interesting in the U.S., in my point of view, is that in 2020, with the election of uh, of Biden, many observers and analysts. I mean, they concluded that U.S. democracy was safe in a way. Four years later, uh, Trump is again back uh, to the race for the presidency, for the White House. It shows in a way that there is a resilience of populism in the U.S. So m my question, uh, Rachel, is what are the factors that are facilitating or helping or supporting the rise and the resilience of populism in the U.S.? Um, could you help us understand these structural, maybe, uh, factors influ influencing uh, populism and democracy in the U.S.? Sure, of course, and such a pleasure to, to be here with you. Um, so I think this follows the old Hemingway quote that people go bankrupt at first gradually and then suddenly. Um, American democracy has been softening gradually for decades. And then we had this sudden acute threat. And I think those of us watching closely did not think we were past that threat in 2020 because of the softening of the underlying ground. So I'd like to make um, three points, I guess, on the broader structural issues. So first of all, Larry Bartles has a new book about populism um, and democracy failing, where he basically says it's an elite problem. It starts from the top. Tom Carruthers has argued that in America, it started from the bottom, that there's this long, long history um, and I think these are, are both true, but um, I, I side a little more with Larry's uh, analysis that the top has been pushing cultural wars um, since the, the mid-70s, really catalyzed by Ronald Reagan in, in 1980 and his campaign, um, and then by Newt Gingrich. And so we, we had a long, long period in which um, many, many voters were uh, identifying in a very polarized manner um, with the body politic. So then along comes Trump, who actually promises to make good on these things that had been rhetorical tropes for most of the Republican Party, but hadn't actually been acted on particularly directly. And you'd had this long softening of, of a group of voters willing to follow along and actually being thrilled that um, finally their party was being responsive. So um, what Larry Bartles argues is that the, the elites shape the ground and, and get voters excited about these policy agenda items that they might not have otherwise been very excited about. And you can see a, a little bit of both Larry and Tom's views um, in America. Voters had long been worried about immigration. 
Um, you can see that in all the data, but it suddenly became extremely salient under Trump and then the media covered it a whole lot. So it's a bit of a back and forth. Second, um, you can't just look at the populace, you have to look at the opposition parties. And in America, the Democratic Party is just extremely uh, poor at fighting this kind of, of populism. They haven't fielded a, a very dynamic set of candidates. Um, there's all sorts of identity group issues that are keeping the Democratic Party from putting forth someone who might uh, attract more attention. Um, and they haven't been great at using new media, things like TikTok and so on, to galvanize younger voters. So you really have to look at opposition parties. You could say the same about India, where um, obviously the BJP is doing very well with Modi, but Congress is really in disarray. And if Congress could put together a better, uh, a better slate, it might be able to fight this populism a little bit better. And then the third part is that um, there are a plurality of voters who like the basic policy tenets of populism. Now, uh, populism is not really a policy-based agenda. It's, it's really about tone and style and so on. But insofar as populism pulls from the left and right and says, we want more government giveaways for you and less for everybody else, um, that is a fairly popular view among about a third of the voters um, in America. That third of the voters moved more into the Republican Party, so they became in 2016, a more coherent group of, of voters. Um, but as Richard was saying, the structure of your election system really matters. So in Europe, th that set of voters is spread. And um, when you don't have a first past the post system, they have much more trouble getting um, to the larger numbers that would allow them to run a government. In America, because of our first past the post system, because of the oddities of our electoral college and the ways in which rural voters um, have outsized power, um, they can overtake one party because they've moved into a party, they've consolidated a, a voter base within that party, and then they're um, voting more in primaries and so on within that party. So they're taking over a one party of a two party system, which gives a very different feel than what we're seeing in, um, in Europe. Uh, and then the last thing I'll say is just on this idea that populism really is about tone and style more than policy. You know, populist leaders, as, as um, Richard had been saying, tend to be a liberal, but the illiberality is not necessarily uh, only populist. You can be a far right party, who, which is not populist, and have many of these illiberal views. What populists are really good at is using polarization to divide the voter base into an us and a them and build intense personal loyalty, which they then use to personalize power, centralize power, and then reduce uh, oversight from within the government and then eventually from the press and the judiciary. Most people care very little about politics, certainly in America. Um, the, the level at which people care about actual politics and policy items is extraordinarily low. It's really a hobbyist um, class that participates in politics. A lot of people, however, have a vague sense of disdain and dislike for politicians, a sense that there's corruption, um, which they don't necessarily mean monetary corruption, but that somehow those people seem to be doing a lot better than regular people. And so this style of us and them, uh, shooting from the hip, personalizing power, saying I can fix it, that can be very, very popular in an individualistic nation like America, where people aren't paying a lot of attention to the policies, but that style and tone appeals to a, a kind of cowboy nation. Thank you. Thank you, Rachel. I mean, you made really very interesting points. And one of them is the, the need to, le to look to the opposition in a way, uh, not to focus on a, a populist-centric uh, centric, uh, analysis in order to understand the, uh, the phenomena and its globality in a way. It's, it's, it's really... Uh, to, to develop a comprehensive uh, understanding, we need really to look at different aspects. Uh, and one of them is the, is the opposition, how mainstream parties, how democratic elites are, are, are also reacting, confronting or fighting the, uh, the, uh, the populist, uh, populist rise. With this point, I would like to turn and to, 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 to go to the MENA and to a specific country actually in the MENA that went through a decade of democratization and then uh, went through sort of democratic backsliding, an authoritarian restitution, which is Tunisia. Um, um, Sarah, you edited a compendium 
uh, on Tunisia's stall dem democratization or democratic transition in a comparative perspective. And there are some very good lessons in this compendium. Um, I mean, drawn on the Peru experience, on other different countries' experience on democratization. Uh, uh, and one of the points that are really extremely important is um, uh, how, in a way, the failure of the political parties, the democratic elites, can lay the ground to the rise of populism. So uh, can you please, um, I mean, help us understand how the, uh, uh, what contributed to the rise of Qais Saeed um, um, and prepared his ultimate power grab in July 2021. He has a specific profile. I mean, he's not uh, Nasser, he's not Gaddafi, he's not coming from the military, he's not coming from the security. He's totally an outsider and he sees the moment, specific moment to, to grab the power uh, and to, I mean, to destroy in a way this democratic transition. So please, I mean, the, the floor is yours. Great, thank you so much. Um, yes, I mean, Saeed was elected in 2019 and what really was sort of the tail end of the populist wave that spread through Europe and also I would say brought President Trump to the United States. And he, in many ways, was a textbook populist. You know, he has no political party. He didn't campaign in any traditional sense. And he also was very smart in that he focused almost entirely on fighting corruption at a time when this was very important to Tunisians. They were still a decade into the transition struggling to how to uproot Ben Ali's kleptocratic networks. He also appealed to people, I think, largely because he was outside of the system in an election where he was pitted against the status quo in many ways. He had many contenders, but some of them, including the sitting prime minister, the minister of defense, a former president, a former prime minister. And so when you look at him as someone who clearly has no political background, no political experience, this was a real win for him. And he was also appealing to those who thought an end to the corrupt and ineffective politics that we've just been talking about. He's a constitutional law professor. So, you know, on paper, he knows the law, but he hasn't actually been inside the political system. So that's a win for him. And he appealed to young people because he actually spoke to them quite literally, sitting in cafes with them in small gatherings, but also metaphorically by being frank and upfront and without any of the sort of flash that the corrupt political class has displayed in the minds of many Tunisians. You know, now as president, he doesn't live in the presidential palace, for example. He maintains none of the sort of, you know, pomp and circumstance of the presidency. And so for Saeed, you know, in July 2021, 18 months after he came into office, he found himself in this position that was both very challenging for Tunisia, but in a way offered him an opportunity in which he was overseeing three interrelated crises, the COVID-19 pandemic, an economy that was in free fall, as well as this just complete political paralysis where you had members of parliament who were literally in fist fights in the halls of parliament. And Saeed, who had been speaking about his desire to overhaul the political system since long before he was elected, saw an opportunity to actually seize power and build for himself this highly centralized system, in reality, a dictatorship that he had been sort of projecting for many, many years. Initially, he got away with it, I think, because many Tunisians at the time were really dissatisfied with the way the democratic transition had played out. They didn't feel like democracy had actually paid off for them. You know, the economy was doing worse. Unemployment was still very, very high. And so a lot of people were quite receptive to Kai Saeed's message that he was going to sort of, in Trump's words, drain the swamp. But what we've seen over the past two years, again, really fits sort of the populist playbook. A lot of his supporters have really seen through his populist veneer and we're seeing Tunisia now, you know, almost be at the edge of an economic cliff with massive polarization that's dramatically increased under Saeed. And he's remained laser focused on this political program that no one was demanding, no one was asking for at the time when he put it in place. And it's failed to do anything to address the economic challenges that both brought about the revolution, you know, a decade before, and that led people to adopt his populist message. So just to sort of close, I mean, I think, you know, just today, Transparency International released its Corruption Perception Index for 2023. And if you look at Tunisia's level of perceived corruption, it's actually gotten worse under Kais Saeed, not better. And so this is the one area that he came to power promising to address, and he actually hasn't even been able to address that. So I really think, you know, in a way, he is this, he's very reminiscent of a lot of other populists. And as I listen to people like Rachel, like Richard, and I'm sure Oliver as well, you know, there's so many parallels between other countries that have experienced populism and what we're seeing in Tunisia today. 
Thank you, Sarah. I mean, this is an extremely important, another again, an extremely important point to understand a bit the populism. You know, populists are very good at vying for power and very bad, you know, at uh, fixing problems. I mean, in most, in many cases, uh, but certainly, I mean, they proclaim, they claim their capacity to fix to fix problems, but this is typically the case of, of, of Said, as you mentioned, and this Transparency International uh, um, I mean, report. I mean, shows this, and the, and the economic situation is is, is another another uh, indication of the incapacity once in power to deliver in a way. Uh, and so, uh, this is quite. Uh, uh, this is a, a parallel, I would say, with or brings us to to Millet, the last to come to the club of populists in a way to get elected in Argentina, and I think Millet has also presented himself as the guy who will fix the uh, the um, the problems uh, argentina's problems uh, but it seems like you know his margin of maneuver is quite limited uh, so i would i'd like to turn to you oliver i mean um it i mean it's clear that uh, the the profile of Millet is quite i mean special in the sense that with his libertarian ideas uh, with his election, etc., he seems like you know he's not a guy coming from the left-leaning, maybe populist. He's uh, an extreme or uh, right-leaning uh, populist, but at the same time, he uh, ca he came with the big idea to dollarize the economy. But it seems like he's um, uh, uh, in a way um, revising his uh, position and the margin, given the fact that the margins of maneuver he has are quite limited. I mean, uh, what are the objectives of this leader, uh, of a leader like Millet can realistically achieve in a, in a, in a, in a context of really highly, um, I mean, um, high constraints and domestically really constraining um, environment, I would say. What are really realistically maybe the chances for him to achieve things or to deliver on what he promised uh, during the elections? Thank you, uh, Hamza. It's a pleasure to be part of the uh, discussion. And I think a lot of what we've heard uh, certainly applies to Latin America, a region that uh, uh, perhaps has uh, more experience with uh, uh, populists than, uh, than many others. And uh, sometimes looking at uh, the crises of democracies around the world, I feel like uh, global democracy has been Latin Americanized to some extent. Uh, so particularly what we're seeing uh, in the United States uh, feels sort of strangely familiar, uh, even though, of course, there are specific differences uh, in each region. And I think uh, just before I answer your question, I, I want to say, in a way, um, the past decade has, uh, you know, uh, made me quite optimistic because uh, Latin American democracy has survived relatively well despite uh, economic stagnation. We've had uh, more than a decade of uh, zero percent growth of GDP per capita, which is precisely when these anti-establishment uh, figures of the populist bent tend to surge. Uh, and this has happened in, in many Latin American countries over the past years, the case of Bolsonaro, for example. Uh, but institutions uh, largely have been able to uh, assure that these figures uh, govern, but they uh, many times, uh, in most cases, were unable to undermine the system to a point where we lost our democracies. In the case of Bolsonaro, uh, I think we came uh, quite close to a democratic rupture, but also thanks to uh, significant international support, particularly uh, from the United States. Uh, Brazil has largely uh, returned to sort of normal. It's, uh, it's quite interesting that uh, less than a year uh, after uh, this very tense moment, uh, it's uh, things feel uh, rather uh, normal. Now, uh, Argentina, of course, with a particular challenging uh, economic uh, environment, uh, was bound to elect somebody like Malay. Uh, actually, over the past years, whenever uh, we visited Buenos Aires and spoke to our colleagues, uh, the debate was always why Argentina had not yet elected uh, somebody like that. Uh, and this was sort of the mystery. Why was there so little protest uh, and polarization? And uh, one of our hypotheses was always that de democratization uh, had functioned so well in Argentina because the uh, armed forces uh, which had governed Argentina prior had not only sort of destroyed the economy, but also uh, had lost the war 
against Great Britain and were so discredited that nobody could even imagine ever trying again any uh, non-democratic uh, solution that this really consolidated uh, Argentine democracy, which was different uh, in Brazil where the transition was less explicit and where the army was not as discredited. Uh, so I think uh, Millet uh, comes to power with this typical uh, populist bend. A lot of uh, what the others have mentioned applies to him, the form uh, and rhetoric, uh, the, the outsider status, uh, the way he presents himself. And he's uh, out of nowhere, in a way, been able to win. But, uh, and he, his rhetoric suggests he, had a, he has a great mandate. But when you look at the Senate and Congress, and the provinces, he doesn't because he has not built a party. And um, in most cases, that means he has to cooperate with the elites that he has demonized during uh, the uh, campaign. And uh, a lot suggests that he will govern in a much more moderate way uh, because he does, won't be able to push through his agenda unless he finds common ground uh, with uh, established parties. Uh, so in a, in a sense, I think that's uh, welcoming news in part and because, and, and I think the um, ideal scenario would be that an outsider like Malay is capable of bringing in ideas that the establishment has actually neglected uh, for some decades, but does so in a, a context of respecting the institutions due to the need to work uh, with established parties. So I think the outcome could actually not be, uh, you know, not that bad. Uh, he has initially tried to concentrate power uh, in the executive, but uh, both the judiciary and the legislature have pushed back. Uh, so in that sense, I'm actually rather uh, optimistic about what uh, will uh, occur in Argentina as a signs of democratic stability. But I just wanted to sort of perhaps uh, share one idea about also the uh, potentially positive impact of these outside figures which sometimes uh, don't do that much damage to democracy, but sometimes bring in subjects which um, established parties have struggled to address. And in, in uh, Latin America, that's obviously uh, transnational crime. It's really quite interesting that over the past years, uh, this hasn't really been a subject among political elites, something which has been kind of accepted. There's no real solution to this. We can't legalize drugs, but the war on drugs has also failed. So let's just sort of leave, leave this. Uh, and, and that has been picked up by uh, fringe candidates like Malay, like Bukele in El Salvador. So sometimes the, the emergence of such figures also obliges established figures to actually address some of the issues which have, for some reason or another, fallen off so the, the political um, radar of the mainstream. Thank you, Oliver. I'll certainly come to the point on, uh, I mean, the war in gang, on gangs, how this, uh, the war, I mean, the security demand how, and how populists are trying to address the, uh, the security demands, actually, of the population in Latin America and how it is playing, really, uh, as you mentioned, this is an important point that is and an important trend that is really shaping the uh, Latin American politics as you as you uh, as you mentioned it. Um, uh, let me I mean after this first overview of populism let uh, I want us to dig a bit into really the deep um, and to, uh, the deep I mean drivers of uh, that are fueling populism in a way, the factors that are really um, fueling populism and I would like to start with Richard uh, uh, Coming to Europe, uh, you wrote uh, uh, an article, Richard, in which you described or you point out to the fact that European politics is trapped or um, grapples with a complex trilemma involving the green transition, social justice, and democratic decline. So the need to accelerate the energy transition, the uh, the the clay or the demand for social justice, and of course the uh, the, the the challenge of democratic decline. Could you help understand? And could you help us understand this puzzle? Because it's really puzzling. And is there a way out in a way that helps maybe rebuild, save, or consolidate democracy? And in a way, um, um, uh, could prevent this rise or surge of populism and far right, as you mentioned in your uh, in your first report. 
Yeah, well, one thing that's really important in the European context is just how sal salient the backlash against the climate agenda is becoming in driving populism. You've got basically three crises fusing together, a democracy crisis, a climate crisis, and uh, economic crisis. Um, together, they, they're almost kind of fueling each other in underpinning the, the latest surge in populism. And it's a trilemma because it's difficult for governments to deal with any one of those crises without worsening the others. So in a European context, governments have been quite ambitious on climate targets. They've often moved ahead with climate action in a fairly top-down way that has made people feel even more disenfranchised, therefore worsening the democracy crisis and feeding into the the populist narrative that uh, ordinary voices, ordinary parts of the population are not being listened to. So that's what we meant by this trilemma. And it does reflect the fact that uh, the, the the backlash, what's, what's called here the green lash, is certainly uh, a rising factor in explaining polarization, growing polarization in Europe, because we see more and more pro protests in favor of ambitious climate action on the one hand, and more and more protests organized around ag against uh, climate action on the other hand. So it's almost becoming a kind of um, a t test case for the broader dynamics of polarization and illiberality that, that Rachel was describing. That doesn't mean that all the people protesting against the climate agenda are hardcore climate deniers. I think the debate is a little bit more nuanced than that. Many people are, in a way, the, the far right parties, the populist parties have uh, latched onto frustration with climate policies as a way of reviving their own flagging support, and they're doing it quite successfully. Surveying shows that most people who are frustrated with climate policies don't deny the need to take climate action, but are frustrated with what they perceive to be the unfairness of the way that the climate agenda is being pursued. And I think here Oliver's point is a good one in terms of these parties often bringing uh, completely legitimate concerns to the agenda, but perhaps pursuing them in an unjustifiable, lib illiberal way. Because up until now, European governments have been in the lead in terms of their climate ambition, but they haven't really begun to address the social consequences of the climate agenda. Who pays for the energy transition? Mm. Now those kinds of issues are on the agenda. They're, they're set to dominate politics more and more during this crucial year of elections. Um, without wishing to idealize, because this is a really, really serious problem, how the green lash is uh, providing extra oxygen to far right parties. But perhaps the silver lining is that it is pushing governments to address some of these issues of social fairness uh, in a way that they were not doing a year or 18 months ago. Um, so I would say that in, in, in a way, European politics may be a test case for what the kind of politics that may come to the MENA and Latin America and other regions. Because European climate policies have been quite ambitious compared to other regions, climate action is really beginning to bite. It's beginning to affect people's day-to-day -day lives. And that's what's driving this backlash against the climate agenda. But sooner or later, these kinds of social consequences of climate politics have to be addressed. And they have to be addressed in Europe as, as other places in the world. And I think that the, the, the politics of climate will become increasingly co consequential for the future of um, of populism and the, and the far right around the world. Thank you. Thank you, Richard. I understand that you have to leave us for another commitment. So thank you very much for your contribution uh, to this debate. Um, actually, absolutely. I mean, this uh, the climate issues are, are extremely important um, and they are, I mean, they are really shaping the agenda in, as you said, in Europe, but for sure, and in, in the US and in other uh, in other regions. I'm, I'm sure that in Tunisia and in, in our region, the MENA region, and in, uh, in, uh, in Latin America, there are different aspects. They are taking different forms. They are shaping politics in different ways, but they are here to uh, to last for, uh, for a moment, for sure. Um, let me turn to Rachel with, uh, again, digging into maybe the structural causes. You wrote about political polarization in the US. 
and maybe in like or to draw a comparison between the EU and 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 the US. Here maybe I'm talking under the control of Richard. In Europe, there is a sort of a debate on the fact that polarization is not only a political polarization, but it's a societal or social polarization between maybe I mean upper middle classes, let's say elites uh, on one side and uh, um, popular classes, uh, low middle classes on the other side, depend depending on. Um, I mean, professional um, uh, trajectories, depending on the level of education, etc. In the US, um, how do you think that polarization is only political, political, or does it reflect maybe a sort of societal polarization or social polarization? Is it really, does it reflect a sort of deep divide within the US society? Or is it rather maybe sort of strategy manipulated, used by elites in a sort of inter-elite competition, as you mentioned uh, uh, earlier in, uh, in our debate. Please. Sure. So I think the first thing to remember about the United States is really just how little most people care about politics. It's hard because all you hear is the chattering classes talking about politics. That's who's writing the op-eds and that's who's on television to um, to get your head around the fact that of the 330 million people or so on that's, that, that are in America, it's just this teeny slice that actually care about ideology or policy. And so most of the argument is at um, a level below that. So to get to what Richard was just talking about with climate policy, you know, the right plays on things like um, people don't like being forced to give up their plastic bags. They don't want to carry bags into stores or they're worried that they'll have to give up their gas stoves. It's not, it's not real and it's not real policy issues. So if you look at the, the numbers, most Americans actually agree on huge amounts of the really hottest, uh, most hot button topics, immigration, abortion, and so on. You get more than 50% agreement, even on gun control issues. Now they prioritize those differently. So Republicans prioritize gun control very low, Democrats very high, but there's agreement about the, um, the policies. The elites don't have that ideological agreement at all. And so you, you get this gridlock and that gridlock's frustrating and it's making people think that actually the other normal Americans disagree rather than the problem being at this, at this elite level. And so we're getting in America this very fast moving social polarization, affective polarization. Um, but while it's moving very quickly, it's actually not higher than is measured in a number of European countries. So ours is moving up faster, but it's not higher. The system, however, um, is incentivizing it. Uh, our first past the post system and all the other structural issues that I was talking about before, so that that social polarization can play a bigger role in our in our politics. Jennifer McCoy has written about this. Uh, she calls it pernicious polarization, when the incentives for um, politicians are to play into that polarization because it helps them win votes. And that's really where we are in America. One other social aspect that I wanted to highlight is the, the gender wars in America. This gets a lot less play than racial issues and so on. But if you look at um, gender and voting for populist parties, and here it's not just America, um, in Europe even, uh, you have uh, men voting for most of the populist parties at double the rate that women do in um, some of the most uh, successful ones, um, like the Swedish Democrats, men voted at five times the rate as, as women. Um, we see the same, I'm not gonna steal Oliver's thunder, but uh, Brazil, uh, Bolsonaro did 10 points better, and also in Argentina, about 10 points better um, for populism among men than, than women. And we see that in America. Trump uh, had a greater male-female gap than has ever existed in a half century of exit polling. So there's something very deep about these populist parties that are appealing to men. I think part of it might be um, what Richard was saying. There's a, there's a dislike of rules, of being hemmed in, whether it's climate rules or other rules. There's a sense of masculinity being emasculated by rules and regulations that populists play into. Um, there's also the issues that have been ignored. So uh, the criminal issues that Oliver was mentioning, men tend to... Uh, raise the salience of, of crime as something that matters more to them in, in polling. Um, but also things like men, uh, traditional masculine jobs falling behind in America. There's evidence that 
places that were hit harder by Chinese manufacturing um, had, had a stronger likelihood of voting for Trump. So basically, it, things that make are, are making men feel emasculated, whether it's on the job front, on a can't protect their family from crime front, or rules and regulations front, seem to be fueling some um, desire to vote for these populist parties. And in America, that's very much being played into by this online manosphere, which is this whole set of online influencers and uh, internet memes and so on, extremely misogynistic uh, that, that are tied into far right politics. So they sort of pull people from you're angry at your girlfriend to you should be voting for a MAGA politician in a couple of, a couple of easy steps. So something's going on there at the deep level of society. And, and I'll end with just saying when, when I started my career, I worked in India on microcredit issues. And you always gave microcredit to women because there was lots of empirical evidence that women spent the money for their families, whereas men might spend it on themselves. But one would never imagine running a program like that without involving the men because you would get increases in domestic violence and all sorts of backlash if you just gave money to women and then didn't do anything for the men. And I think for a couple of decades now, we've been empowering women and not really thinking about how men are gonna experience that backlash and we might be reaping some of it now. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Rachel. I mean, this is an important point. I mean, this correlation between gender and the electoral behavior actually is, is quite fascinating. I mean, really something uh, that needs, for sure. I mean, even in Tunisia, uh, and uh, I know that uh, Sarah, I mean, have been, uh, uh, I mean, knows this very well. I mean, the gender aspects have been playing an important role on on the electoral behavior, etc., for this or that leader. So, yeah, it's uh, it's uh, it's it's quite quite fascinating in a sense that it's, it shapes the uh, the the position of, uh, I mean, vis-a-vis. -vis, uh, I mean, um, mainstream politics, but also vis-a-vis -vis, uh, new offers coming from outside of the uh, of the uh, of the political spectrum. Um, uh, let me turn to uh, to Sarah, Richard. Please, if you want to leave us, feel free. I think uh, at seven thirty, feel free to. Uh, yeah, thank you. Many apologies. We have an event starting, but it was a pleasure and good to see everyone. Thank you. Good to see you too. Uh, so let's turn to Sarah uh, for another aspect, which is really quite fascinating in my sense. I don't know if you agree, Sarah, or not. Really, I would be really extremely interested to have your views on this. But it seems like, you know, to make a distinct, uh, distinction between uh, maybe Ben Ali and the old dictator and Said, maybe the new rising dictator, I mean, the new populist figure. I mean, it seems like Ben Ali dictatorship was really based on repression, on fear. But unlike this kind of style of dictatorship, the new style of, uh, of Said is rather based on scapegoating, manipulation, um, on post-truth in a way. I mean, uh, um, um, I, I mean, really, it's it's a style that is that. It's like it's not uh, it's not uh, this uh, hard and fierce dictatorship, but it's rather a spin dictatorship in a way. He's like you know he's like it seems, he seems like a, a sort of a spin dictator. So so how how does this I mean a strategy exacerbate political polarization in Tunisia, and how this strategy uh, I mean of manipulation, the recourse to post truth, you know the uh, scapegoating, etc., impedes any constructive dialogue in the country that would have allowed maybe or facilitated the sort of return maybe to, to democratization or to democracy. Yeah, I think it's a really good point. And I, I agree with you. I mean, I think what we've seen come out of Said is, again, this like following this populist playbook in a way that Ben Ali never did. Um, and, you know, I think it's not a surprise that we've seen Kai Said, for example, put forward a fake news law where you can go to jail for up to 10 years for publishing something that's critical of the government that's deemed fake by the government. Um, but what we've seen him do over the past two years and, and before, but really since his self-coup, is just systematically turn his followers against different parts of Tunisian society at different times, which has been further and further dividing the public. And this started off initially with Isla the Islamist party in Ahda, who was his sort of first original scapegoat. 
who he started off blaming for pretty much all of Tunisia's political woes, despite the fact that while they were in power throughout the, the de democratic transition, they were never solely in power. You know, they had ruled in coalitions and by 2019 only held less than a quarter of the seats in parliament. Um, but he also turned then against the business community. And once the food shortages started showing up, in large part due to the war between Russia and Ukraine, where Tunisia depended on uh, wheat from Russia and Ukraine, he started blaming speculators for those food shortages, hoarders for the food shortages. He then had his most dangerous uh, blaming in which he blamed African migrants for economic problems. He used this very racist language of the great replacement theory and ended up unleashing waves of violence against migrants as well as black Tunisians. And he at all, while this was going on, was blaming the international community for manipulating civil society and interfering in Tunisia's affairs. And I think, you know, what we've seen is that he's gone after very effectively different groups at different times in order to serve his needs. And, you know, as he's gotten, I think, more desperate and people are starting to sort of turn away from him, it's becoming less effective and sort of maybe less efficient for him to do this. And just most recently, you know, I think in one of his most bizarre attacks, he swept up a variety of different opposition figures from across the political spectrum in the same kind of broad case, accusing them of crimes related to terrorism. You have people, I'm you know, sorry. Are, yes. Can you can you hear me? Sorry, Sarah, I got, oh, yeah. Uh, yeah, yeah, I had a problem with my connection. So it, uh, yeah, please go ahead. Okay. okay. Um, no, I was just saying, you know, you have people who are complete political enemies but are accused of working together on this terrorist conspiracy that clearly doesn't exist. And the result has been, first of all, dangerous social and political polarization. But more importantly, as I was talking about before, is just the failure to address the real problems in the country, driving Tunisia further into an economic decline. But he's also you know, isolated Tunisia from most of its traditional supporters, and this includes the United States and much of Europe who have been largely reticent to support his regime in the wake of his behavior. But, you know, to your point also has prevented the opposition from uniting and mounting a real and serious challenge against him. And I think, you know, at the end of the day, he holds all the power, Kais Said. So the scapegoating and the blame really rings hollow and more and more people are starting to see that. Um, and we'll see, you know, in 2024 this year, Tunisia is potentially facing presidential elections, which will be kind of the next test for Said. It's not 100% clear that that's going to happen. But, um, you know, I don't think we should expect him to lose. This is not going to be a free and fair competition. But there is an opportunity to see if the opposition can actually overcome some of this polarization and unite around a candidate. However, I think, you know, given the skill at which he's been able to divide the public, I don't think we're likely to see that happen. Thank you, Sarah. Uh, let me turn to Oliver. I mean, you mentioned uh, uh, a very good point regarding the uh, the capacity of these outsiders to uh, to address or to meet the demands in terms of uh, the security demand of the population through the the war on uh, organized crime, the war on gangs, etc. So my question is: to what extent this war on gangs or the war in organized crime that is being now um, uh, uh, um, undertaken by in Mexico and Salvador, etc., is reshaping the power arrangements? in these countries. So what's behind, you know, this war on organized crime? Because what we are, what at least as observers from outside of the region, external observers, you know, it seems like there is maybe a rise, a rise of the military uh, in public affairs. This is what we saw, what we are hearing, uh, uh, especially in the case of Salvador and Mexico. I'd like really to have your take on this. I mean, what's behind the war on organized crime? that uh, really the populist figures are are using as their, um, I mean, big maybe topic in their agenda. Yeah, um, I just wanted to, before that, uh, quickly um, piggyback on what uh, Rachel said about, about gender, which is really quite uh, interesting. I, I read uh, her piece uh, she published for uh, Persuasion, uh, and I actually recorded a video uh, which I shared online uh, about this subject, uh, speaking specifically about the United States, which is a very subtle way to sort of bring a topic into the Brazilian debate because I'm just sort of addressing something from somewhere else. And it was really fascinating because it sort of went viral and lots of uh, men uh, were saying that, uh, you know, it's uh, this whole agenda, uh, you know, make, that protects women's rights is actually anti-men. 
and there's all this uh, content of sort of uh, masculine uh, victimization of, of of men which sort of and it was quite interesting because this hasn't really been a subject of mainstream parties in brazil people have largely ignored this issue of say uh, the fact that um which is true in brazil as well that for example um uh, women perform better in uh, in schools and there's all sorts of uh dynamics which uh let's say um with, and i'm not as a specialist in the subject but which uh should um make policymakers pay attention to this and perhaps speak about uh new ideals of uh manhood for example which uh which are possibly outdated uh in brazil and it was quite interesting because a lot of these like uh, bolsonaro voters uh, uh, you commented on this and uh, and said this is a key issue. Bolsonaro talked about it, but nobody else did, and that really ties into um, the uh, issue of the, the fight against uh, transnational crime. An interesting divergence uh, uh, among men and women. Uh, men tend to be more supportive of uh, militarizing the response to organized crime. Uh, they also tend to be more supportive of facilitating the access. Uh, to weapons uh, for for citizens, uh, so to liberalizing uh, gun policies, uh, and, um, and and whereas women are more concerned that the uh, large quantity of guns circulating may actually, for example, as a collateral uh, impact, increase the uh, impact of uh, domestic violence, which is largely directed uh, against women. So uh, some of these issues are, 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 they have a gender dynamic as well. Now, um, the fight against transnational crime, of course, um, is now beginning because of what we're seeing in Ecuador, uh, but also in El Salvador, where 2% of the adult population uh, has been imprisoned, uh, but also a perception that uh, mainstream parties haven't been able to successfully uh, address this over the past decade, uh, which is related to um, limited state capacity, uh, where in poor regions uh, of uh, many Latin American countries, uh, the service providers are actually uh, cartels, uh, and a lot of citizens who, for example, don't have access to basic human rights in the prison, when they, when they go to prison, are actually uh, uh, seek to join organized crime in order to protect uh, themselves against human rights violations uh, in the prison system, and that allows these uh, groups uh, to to expand. So I, I think that um, we are stuck in a world in which, uh, let's say, sort of progressive groups uh, speak about long-term solutions uh, of you know uh, creating economic opportunities, and uh, increasingly populists uh, defend this Bukele-type uh, solution, militarized solution that we're seeing in El Salvador but that none of these two alone will be able to su successfully uh, address this issue. But I think what we're seeing is an expansion of these groups. Uh, states lack currently uh, uh, a regional strategy and the uh, subject is deeply polarizing, which makes it uh, more difficult to articulate a cohesive and rational debate about how to respond to this. Thank you, Oliver. We are reaching the end of the panel and uh... Uh, it was really a very interesting discussion. I'd like to end with a question, a quick question to all of you, I mean, to the three of you, and to kindly ask you for quick answers in one minute, maximum. Um, I think Sarah and Rachel and you, Oliver, you mentioned that there is a populist toolkit or playbook in a way, and you had really a nice, uh, nice expression, Oliver, uh, the Latino, Latin Americanization of, uh, of, uh, of the global democracy. It shows that there, are, there is a circulation of modern strategies, tactics, that populists are learning from uh, one another. So my question is, what can pro-democracy actors do to fight populism? Are, is there, I mean, are, they, are there lessons maybe to learn, good practices, a toolkit maybe, ideas to really better or confront populism? Let's start with Rachel, Sarah, and then Oliver. 30 seconds maximum, please. Sorry. I mean, I see that we are really, we have one or two minutes left. So please, the floor is yours. Okay. Um, in Poland, they won in part by going to where the people were. So getting on the popular platforms, especially for younger voters. Um, in Israel, it looks like they're poised to push back some, some um, authoritarian more than populist 
activity. And that's by reaching out to really broad bases of voters, not sticking to one set of issues, but making democracy a bread and butter issue for many, many people and allowing them to not just Latin Americanize it, but um, you know, bring it into their personal little group. I'll stop there. Thank you. Sarah, please. Sure, yeah, very quickly, you know, one thing that activists and civil society organizations can do is highlight the hypocrisy to show that the um, populist leaders are not delivering on the things that they said they would deliver on and just make it clear that the emperor has no clothes. Thank you. Oliver, please, the floor is yours. Well, I'd uh, like to perhaps just add to this, I agree with uh, both Rachel and Sarah, is that um, some of the issues that uh, populists are in their very quirky and weird ways, sometimes in non-productive ways, are bringing into discussion shouldn't be ignored. I think that's one of the issues, uh, that some of the uncomfortable issues need to be embraced. Uh, and secondly, uh, if possible, uh, learn from some of the populists when it comes to communication and form and rhetoric and not uh, when it comes to content necessarily, uh, because there is something that I think... Uh, even moderates uh, can learn from some of the populist tendencies we've seen across Latin America over the past years. On this note, I'd like really to thank you very much, really, for your valuable insights. I really enjoyed moderating this discussion, and I learned a lot, really, from your perspectives, your insights, uh, and your comments. Uh, um, thank you so much. Uh, uh, thanks to our audience, and uh, I hope to see you uh, for other events and other webinars organized by Carnegie Middle East Center. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.